Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, everyone. I hope you've had a great couple of weeks. I've been getting lots done on the book, The Comprehensive Guide to Season 1 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. I can't wait to get this out for you. It's It's been so great to be able to add extra goodies and really detail out everything so that you can have it in black and white ready to use. And it's it's really been fun to go back over everything that we've talked about over those first 20 episodes. But I'm back at the microphone and I'm raring to talk genealogy because I've really missed that. Tim Agazio of the Genealogy Reviews Online website at genealogyreviewsonline.com blogged about the Genealogy Gems podcast on July 29th of 2007. The blog article is entitled Genealogy Gems. You've got to check this one out. He has some very kind words for the podcast, and I really appreciate the glowing review. You can read the article by going to my website at genealogygems.tv and clicking on the resources button. And be sure to bookmark this website because Tim offers some great insight into what's new out there in the world of genealogy. I think you'll like it. As you can probably tell by now, I am quite a movie buff. My most recent passion is silent movies. You could listen to episode 14 of the podcast for more information on how the silent era can add substance to your understanding of your ancestors' lives. But I have that great new technology that the cable company offers now called DVR, and I've been recording up a storm this last year. My favorite channel is the Turner Classic Movies. Of course, in particular, I always keep an eye out for movies that draw those parallels to my ancestors' lives or cover historical events. So I'm going to indulge myself, and I'm going to start a little section of the podcast called Lisa's Movie Picks, where I can share some of my favorites with you, and hopefully they'll become some of your favorites. Well, this week I want to tell you about the 1957 movie Full of Life. It's starring the wonderful Judy Holliday, who's most famous for her portrayal of Billy Dawn in the 1950 movie Born Yesterday, which is a riot. And uh, Richard Conti uh, stars as her husband. And they're a couple expecting their first child. There's a really fun and funny scene in the movie where she's very pregnant and she falls through the kitchen floor, <laughs> creating a large hole. And um, so when that home repair needs to be done, they find out that they really can't afford to fix the hole. And Nick, her husband, has to swallow his pride and ask his father, who's a proud Italian immigrant stonemason, uh, who he has a very strained relationship with, he has to ask him to do the work. Well, Papa Vittorio Rocco is played by the terrific actor and opera singer Salvatore Baccaloni. The movie is based on the 1952 novel by John Fonte, also called Full of Life. What I love about the movie is that it easily could have become a comedy of errors, but instead it finds its way to the issues that faced immigrants and their American-born children in the 1950s. The central conflicts are around religion and family tradition. Papa Rocco cleverly challenges Nick and Emily to reevaluate their fast-paced and even self-absorbed busy lives and the things that they value most. Now, you don't see too many films today where the older generation is actually portrayed as wise and clever, and full of life is really refreshing because of this. And of course, I love watching Salvatore Baccaloni's portrayal of a robust Italian immigrant talking about the family values that he learned in the old country. As I mentioned in episode 14, my great-grandmother was born in Prussia, and my grandmother was born in America. And according to my grandmother's diaries from the teen years, they faced many of those same cultural challenges. So this story really captivated my interest, not to mention that Papa Rocco and, and his wife lived on a farm in the San Joaquin Valley in the 1950s, just as my great-grandparents did. The novel by John Fonte is still available, and I'll have links for that in the episode 21 show notes. And Turner Classic Movies is probably your best bet for catching the movie. I'll have a link in the show notes to their website where you can keep an eye out for it. 
It was also released on VHS several years back, and you might be able to find a copy in your local video store or on eBay. It's a really heartwarming movie and one that you can watch comfortably with your kids and your grandkids. Now, coming up next is a listener's email that has prompted a Freedom of Information Act follow-up. I got the following email this week from Richard Harasnak. And Richard, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. He writes, I loved the tip about requesting your ancestor's immigration file through the Freedom of Information Act. Do you know if you can do the same thing with a person's military record? Well, yes, indeedy do. You can use the Freedom of Information Act when requesting military records. In fact, Richard, this brings up a really good point that I mentioned briefly in Episode 20, but it's really worth repeating here. The Freedom of Information Act is a tool that can help you out with any type of record held by the U.S. government. In fact, I found a great website that will give you all the background on the FOIA, which is what it's commonly referred to. As you can imagine, newspaper and television reporters are very interested in digging up governmental records for their investigative reporting. And that's not a lot different than what we do as genealogists, really. It's just that we're investigating different things. Well, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press website has a great section devoted to the FOIA. And it's aptly called, How to Use the Freedom of Information Act. Imagine that. So go to my website at genealogygems.tv and click on the podcast tab to find the episode 21 show notes. And there you will find a link directly to it. What's great about this website is that it's a do-it-yourself guide for non-governmental types like you and me. And it's kept up to date with all the recent court opinions on the FOIA and how it's administered. Now, just to recap, the Federal Freedom of Information Act gives you access to all records of all federal agencies in the executive branch, unless those records fall within one of the nine categories of exempt information, which agencies are permitted but generally not required to withhold. Now, as the guide states, the FOIA applies to every agency, department, regulatory commission, government-controlled corporation, and other establishment in the executive branch of the federal government. Now, this includes cabinet offices such as the Department of Defense, State, Treasury, Interior, Justice, which includes the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which we talked about, and the Bureau of Prisons. It also includes independent regulatory agencies and commissions, Um, government-controlled corporations such as the Postal Service and Amtrak and presidential commissions. Now think about the possibilities here. Many of these groups have the potential of possessing records that might pertain to your research. While there could be very well some permitted exemptions in some cases, as I said in episode 20, I think the point here is to ask if there is a document of value to you that you believe that they may have. Now, Richard asked specifically about military records, and indeed, the FOIA can assist you in obtaining those. Now, I'm not an expert in this, and I am very fortunate in having inherited the original military records that I would have been interested in, but I've got some great resources for you from folks who have used the FOIA to request military records. First is Rod Powers of About.com, and he does a great job of outlining how to obtain military records. I'll have a link in the show notes to a terrific article that he wrote on the subject, which specifically addresses the FOIA as well. Second, I want to direct you to the National Archives website. The link in the show notes will take you directly to their article called Access to Military Records by the General Public, Including Genealogists, who are not next of kin. Perfect. So again, I'll have that link for you. And third, Timothy E. Blaze has a website devoted to the infantry regiment that his uncle served in. And Timothy outlines his experiences with obtaining military records. He puts it very plainly by saying, obtaining military records can be, let's say, a pain in the butt. But hopefully by reading his experiences and following the advice on all of these really specific websites, 
you'll have a little easier time of it. You know, there is a person in your family who is brimming with memories. Someone you've never interviewed. It's someone who knew your parents and your grandparents very well, and possibly they even knew your great-grandparents. This individual has a wealth of knowledge that will be of tremendous value and inspiration to your children, your grandchildren, and future descendants. This person is you, and I call this little gem, thanks for the memories. In the midst of all our diligent family history research, we often forget that we too are a resource. We don't want to be selfish, do we, and just look for stuff that interests us. We also want to provide the information that will be of interest to our descendants. Now, before you run scared thinking I'm going to ask you to write your autobiography, I want to tell you I approach this subject in a much kinder and gentler way, so no worries. I call this gem, Thanks for the Memories, because that's really how I first approached writing down my memories for the future generations. It's actually kind of fun to do. Just get a piece of paper or pull up a, web, a Word document. Now just close your eyes for a second, unless you're driving, of course, while you're listening, and visualize a favorite memory from your childhood. In my case, I started with a favorite place, my maternal grandmother's house. But perhaps yours is the back alley where you and your friends played baseball or your great uncle's garage where he showed you how to work on cars. Whatever is meaningful to you. After all, that's what your descendants want to hear about. The stuff that was meaningful to you. Now open your eyes and write your thoughts one at a time. Just free flow it. They don't have to be complete sentences. The best way I can demonstrate this to you is to read to you my memories of my grandma's house. I just mentally walked around the room and I jotted down what I remember. Grandma Burkett's house. The low roar of the window air conditioner in the living room. The clinking of jewel-colored aluminum drinking cups. Boxes of Czech cereal stored under the kitchen sink. A dish towel thrown over the left shoulder of my grandma while she was working. Black poodle dogs scampering through the house and making themselves comfortable next to me on the old couch. Sage green and sometimes hospital green colored living room walls. A lovely glass anniversary clock on the fireplace mantel. My grandpa sitting in his chair with one knee up and one folded under him watching television. The TV guide on the end table next to my grandpa's chair, an ashtray, a carton of camel cigarettes, a lamp, his glasses, and a page of the newspaper folded just to expose the day's crossword puzzle. The pretty round end table in front of the living room window and a lamp with a glass base sitting on a doily and a small drawer in the front with a rounded front to blend into the round table. Afghan blankets crocheted by Grandma and my mom on the back of the couch. Old letters on the buffet in the dining room. A niche in the hallway that held the black, heavy rotary telephone with a cord attached that was long enough to bring the phone anywhere in the house. And Grandma's metal flip-up phone directory. That niche seemed like such a special place as we never had anything like it in any of the houses where I grew up. A mail slot in the wall in the dining room tucked between the window and a corner cabinet. It seemed like magic the way the mailman could come up on the porch and drop something into the house, and the mail would thud on the floor when it arrived. A standalone range in the corner of the tiny kitchen and a set of very big knives on top. Ceramic tile kitchen counters. The door that led from the tiny kitchen into the dark, mysterious garage where Grandma kept all her canned goods and where we knew that mice lived, although I never saw one, because Grandma would tell us about them. Sometimes I thought I could hear them scurrying around. It was musty in that garage, and there was a big, waist-high freezer. The ornate, white, iron love seat on the front porch. You get the idea? 
My grandchildren can now read this and spend time in Grandma's house with me when I was a child. Later, you can try your hand at writing more of your actual experiences or memories of a person. Again, it doesn't have to be a novel or sound really professional. It's just the memories from your heart. Here's a little paragraph that I wrote um, to try to further describe my grandmother specifically. My grandma Burkett, my mom's mother, was artistic and loved drawing and drama. She was a do-it-yourselfer, remodeling, going out to the orchards to pick her own fruit for canning. She was very warm and loving. Family meant everything to her. She would drive the 800 miles from her house in California to ours in Washington just to see me in a play or spend Christmas with us. Grandpa wouldn't go anywhere, but that never once stopped her. She traveled to the Philippines with a girlfriend looking for a cure for arthritis. She and her friends traveled a lot. She loved car trips. Grandma would get up at 4 a.m., drive to Lake Tahoe about three hours away, and gamble, and drive straight home at midnight that night. She would give me rolls of quarters when I visited. I felt rich. She was tough when she had to be, though sometimes she failed to be tough when it was needed and made no apologies about it. If she was mad, she would grit her teeth and scrunch her eyebrows. Yep, I've been known to do that. The more I think about it, the more I realize I'm very much like her. I guess she was my favorite person, and I wanted to be like her. You could even tie together this gem with episode 20's Sweet Memories gem, where we made a family history chocolate bar label for a candy bar that could be tucked into a Christmas stocking as a gift. Try replacing the ingredients list on the back label with a text box that includes these free-flowing memories about the photo that appears on the front label. You could even expand this idea into a, a Valentine's chocolate bar or an Easter candy bar. Your photos could be from those holidays in the past, and then the back label would include your memories of those times from your childhood. Whether you create a custom holiday candy bar or you just tuck your notes away in a binder for the future, start collecting these memories today while you can. Your descendants will thank you. That's it for this episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast. Please visit the website at genealogygems.tv where you'll find lots of fun family history goodies. And feel free to contact me at Genealogy Gems Podcast at gmail.com. So until next time, I wish you a treasure trove of genealogical gems, and I'll talk to you soon. <music>